Right then, so um, I think our numbers are sort of settled. Nearly 100 participants, which is fantastic. Um, oh, Antonia from Colourful Minds, excellent. Oh, so lots of support from friends, which is brilliant. So, um, yeah, let's get cracking. Hopefully, uh, Jessica will be able to join us in a bit. Um, if not, I'm sure we can throw extra questions at Sam, <laughs> and I'm sure he'll be able to handle it. So, um, yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, my name's Daisy, so I'm in the team at NQ. Um, for anyone who doesn't know us, we're MQ, we're the mental health research charity and we're the leading charity funding much needed scientific research to transform the lives of everyone affected by mental illness. We want to create a world where mental illness is understood, effectively treated and ultimately prevented. Um, this is the second in our MQ Open Mind webinar series and you can access our previous webinar on how we can look after our mental health as lockdown eases on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to ask our panelists a question, you can use the question function and we'll get back to you at the end. So we've got our own set of questions we're going to ask at the beginning and then there'll be space at the end for you to ask your questions. Why are we discussing black mental health? Um, following the death of George Floyd in the United States, there's been another wave of the Black Lives Matter movement across the globe, highlighting the importance of addressing systemic racism. Black mental health has been a considerable challenge within the sector for a long time. Black British people are more likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act, diagnosed with psychosis, or to encounter inpatient mental health services than white people in the UK. There's also an underrepresentation of young people accessing mental health services when we know early intervention is so important. There is significant stigma, stigma around mental illness within many black communities, meaning some people may not be seeking the support that they need. Um, so we're delighted to have our panelists joining us for the evening. So Sam, if you'd like to introduce yourself to start with and just tell us a little bit about yourself and your connection with Colourful Minds. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so my name's uh, Sam Kweakon. Uh, I'm a trainee in uh, child psychiatry, um, working in Kent at the moment, um, but obviously grew up in uh, South London. Um, and I work with Colourful Minds, which is an organisation that looks to try and increase knowledge and understanding of mental health and illness um, in the Black and Asian and minority ethnic groups, um, specifically in South London. Thank you. And Charles, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, we can't hear you. Sorry, Charles, can you unmute yourself so we can... Ah, just there we go. Just okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, my name's Charles Willey. Um, and I was going to say, fortunately, i uh, happy to say that I'm now retired. Um, I used to be the, um, amongst other things, uh, the Equality Advisor to the Welsh Government. I uh, did that for six years uh, when the National Assembly was first set up. Um, and uh, more recently, the Chief Exec of an organisation called Diverse Cymru. Thank you. And Suzanne, will you introduce yourself? Unmute. <laughs> It took me a while, but I had to unmute myself. Um, hello, my name is Suzanne Duval. I'm the BME a Mental Health Manager at Diverse Cymru. Um, and I've been working in policy for around 20 years now and doing this work for around 12, 20 years. A uh, Welsh Government pays me to keep race on the mental health agenda in Wales. And I think I'm the only person working, getting paid to do this job. So I am the spokesperson for Wales heavy task, you can't speak for everyone and we don't know everything, but I know some things. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. And Andrea, if you introduce yourself. Hi, good evening, thank you. Um, my name is Andrea Corbett. I am the founder and director of an organisation called Focus CIC, which stands for Focus on Creating Your Ultimate Self. Um, our aim is to educate and empower young women and girls from the um, BAME community, to educate and empower them about the benefits of physical and mental health. That the CIC was born from my own lived experience of being diagnosed with a mental health illness and using physical activity to manage my mental health. And prior to that happening in 2015, I, I am still, because I'm a qualified secondary school teacher, so my background's in education, and 
I'm currently um, also working as a performance and mindset coach, um, working supporting women to help them you know, overcome their self-limiting beliefs, build their confidence and you know, grow their mindset muscle and also some parts of resilience as well. Uh, there's a lot of work going on. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. And an MQ ambassador. <laughs> All <Yeah>. that. <laughs> Excellent. So um, let's get started then. Um, so I just wanted to sort of just to start, ask you all briefly, um, what do we know about black mental health and why is it so important to have conversations about this topic? So maybe we just, um, I'm just going by the order I'm seeing everyone in the screen. So starting with Sam again, if that's okay. Yeah, um, so I think it's, from my perspective, it's a big issue because I think internally there's, there's no difference between black, white, Asian or any other ethnic group, but it's quite clear that externally and societally there's a difference in engagement and treatment. Um, and, you know, we know that mental health affects how we think, we feel, how we act, and it's susceptible to everything we experience around us. Um, so it's really important to focus on um, you know what state it's in and make everyone aware that it's something that is really important um, especially if we know that black people have a different experience um, to um, people of other ethnicities um, so there's a need to focus on that and make sure that we're making things as equal as we can in terms of opportunities and um, support. Brilliant thank you and Charles? You're on mute again. <laughs> get the hang of it. There we go. Okay. Um, in many ways, um, in terms of uh, agree very much uh, with um, what um, Sam has actually outlined. Uh, but for me, it's not just about uh, conversations. And um, indeed, what I'll be talking about today is that uh, we've had lots of conversations and sorry to say lots of research and so forth. But it is about uh, what actions can we do in terms of dealing yeah, with these issues? And that is my focus, if you like, yeah, uh, because I can go back uh, 30 years ago, uh, the issues were still there. Uh, and in terms of that, uh, what uh, I really want to be able to sort of talk about is um, what actions can we actually take? What practical actions to move things forward? Brilliant, thank you. And I know that you have been working on some amazing things in Wales, and we'll get to that later. So that we'll hear about all your practical actions. And Suzanne, how about you? Well, um, I'd say that I know about um, black mental health, both professionally um, and um, practically, because I, you know, I, I am a woman with um, lived experience, so I have that to call on. Um, and there's members of my family as well with, with uh, mental health. I've had, had mental health anyway. And, um, and I've been doing this work for the last, the last 20 years. So there's lots of things that I've been reading, on, reading up, but being part of as well. And usually in Wales, you know, have some, uh, some Welsh counterparts in there as, as part of our participants. Um, a lot of the things that we say or we do or we think we know is, is around, um, we, we read English, a lot of English things, because there's, there's not a lot of um, reports or things that have gone on in England, or if they've gone on in England, they've included Wales as well. So there's not a lot of Welsh specifics around black mental health, but I do know that the things we read in England, you might as well say, yeah, it's the same things that are happening in, in Wales as well. So there's, there's a huge uh, inequity, I know, in the, in, the black men, in the mental health services as well, especially for black people because of the poorer outcomes um, that we experience. So that, that's my, uh, my view as well. And keeping race on the agenda is not, it's not just about that, but seeking accountability as well, which is paramount if we want to get things, get things moving. People have to take responsibility. Brilliant. Thank you. And Andrea? I think for me, it's like education. Um, from my own personal perspective, when I was diagnosed, although I'm an educated black woman, I wasn't educated about the facts around mental health. Uh, it was just mainly the stigma that I had in regards to it, especially from the black community, and which were mainly negative. So I think educating people, I know we're having conversations about it, but are these conversations educating people. Um, I'm also a youth mental health first 
aid instructor and I know that there isn't a lot on that, that curriculum that focuses on black mental health specifically and as we're, I'm sure we're going to allude to that fact during this conversation that that is although we know that mental health doesn't discriminate but the external sources do discriminate. So I think that that's something that needs to really be addressed in terms of both from youth, you, I, as I said, I'm youth, but I think it's the same in, um, in the adult curriculum as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so Suzanne, I know that you've um, had worked on some research on black mental health. Could you tell us a little bit about your findings? It's that mute and unmute. See, I, it takes me a while. I'm so sorry. Um, well, I'd like to pay respect anyway, because I know as one of the participants is Dr. Aya Seltus um, from Wales, and um, and she she's a, a research fellow, and I work with her on on some of these things that I'm going to talk about now. Um, and I work specifically, um, I say, keeping race on the mental health agenda in in the Welsh government throughout Wales. But the uh, research I've been involved, the two that I want to highlight anyway, was one called the BE4 study, which Raya undertook, and that was in 2005. And it looked at improving the quality of access to information and appropriate treatment in mental health and social care to BAME people in Cardiff. And I believe that then that was like the first report of its kind in Wales that was looking at colour and, and services and outcomes. And then in 2013, again with, with Raya and, and some others, we were involved in the secondary analysis uh, for Wales for the 2005 to 2010 Company in Census, um, which is a census and it was led by the Department of Health and, and it counted for um, England and Wales. And it was the results of a national census of inpatients and, and patients on supervised community treatment um, in mental health and learning disability services in England and Wales and the census was taken on the 31st of March um, every year um, for those for those six years so from 2005 to 2010 they took a census and um, so with the discontinuation of the census in England and Wales there's a substantial gap in ethnic monitoring in Wales also we stopped showing up the um, the inequity that we as black people face in the mental health system and treatment and from the most recent findings first from the independent review of the mental health act which that they came out in december 2018 a couple of things black people were over four times more likely to be detained under the mental health act than, than white groups and then there's underrepresentation at board level two-fifths of london's nhs trust boards have no bay members at all and that's what came out of the the amend um not the amendment act the mental health act in, in review in december and then from the company in if i just say a, um, a couple of uh, things from there black people are 40 percent more likely to be turned away when seeking help from mental health services for example then there's black patients in mental health institutions are 29 percent more likely to be forced Hang on, Suzanne, I think you're on, on mute. Hold this, there you go, hold the space bar down while you're talking in that. Okay, okay. And then I think the last one, black patients in mental health institutions are 49% more likely to be placed in seclusion. So those are just three facts that came out from the company in census report. And I know that report was 2011 and now it's 2020, but from what I read, you see the same, or all the stats get higher. So it doesn't matter, it seems to me, and I say this loads of times, I don't care if I'm reading a report from 2002. It might be worse now. It never gets down, it never gets less, it never gets wiped out, it never seems to get better. So although they sound like old stats, just add to it. That's what I always think. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Right then, um, so this next question would have been for oh. Jess, but are you all right to pick this up, Sam, if that's okay? Just to tell us a little bit about your work at Colourful Minds and how you are working to reduce stigma around mental health in BME communities in South London. Sure. Um, so we're, 
rare group, a, a collection of um, some mental health professionals, but not all, but I think the key thing that binds us together is that we, we have at least a passion to try and improve um, understanding and education of mental health. I think specifically growing up in South London, I think, um, speaking for myself, my understanding of mental health was very small, especially before I went into medicine, before I actually became a medical student and had no experience in psychiatry. Um, but yeah, I'm sure that around me, there were people who were suffering with things like depression, with anxiety, um, learning disabilities, and possibly things like ADHD. And, and that wasn't something that I was aware of. Um, and so obviously the, the stigma is there if I, if I did hear of someone struggling or I saw someone behaving in a certain way, that was automatically just a strange person, someone you want to keep away from, not someone you actually want to support, which is quite worrying. Um, and so what we do as an organization is we go into schools, but then also community organizations such as churches and faith groups as well, and try to actually set up workshops where people can be educated and be able to ask questions and be informed um, and just be able to work through and try and remove some of that stigma, try and uh, increase understanding and, and make it so that people feel like they can talk about experiences that either they have or people around them have. Um, what we've also tried to do as well as putting on the workshops, we've tried to set up things that can remain after we've left as well. Um, so that's where our psychologists try to be able to set up, set up some reflecting groups between um, you know, authority figures like teachers or faith leaders, so they can talk amongst themselves and be able to think about how they can support their, you know, their people who are under their pastoral care as well. Brilliant. And so I imagine that young people would be quite receptive to it, but is there, um, is there a bit, bit of pushback back around discussions of mental health amongst the parents or, or is it okay? <laughs> Well, I think there's, it has been quite good. I think reception has always been really good every time we've put on any kind of workshop or, or done any kind of talk or um, discussion groups. Um, I think, like you said, you know, children are quite receptive. I think we, you know, we don't see the same um, prejudices in children because they, you know, they, they're, they're almost like a, a sponge. They soak up what's around them. So if you surround them with positive um you know, positive things with regards to mental health and things like that, and then they're going to take on that. Um, and actually, we've noticed that the um, older people, the parents, the teachers, the leaders, they're actually really happy to get this support because actually they're seeing that people are more aware of it. You know, the, the children or the people that they're uh, maybe leading or in charge of are more knowledgeable about mental health, not necessarily the in-depth, but they know it exists. They want to talk about it a bit more. And so they feel like they need to be knowledgeable. They need to seek that information from somewhere. So I think they, you know, from what they've said, they really appreciate someone like ourselves, um, who, you know, some of us have quite a bit of experience in working with people who have suffered with mental illnesses or um, who want to focus on their mental health, for us to go in there and give them that information and just allow them to even ask silly questions, you know, things that maybe you would assume that you should know, but you just don't. And that's okay because we can come in and normalize talking about it, normalize not necessarily knowing about it, but wanting to know about it, wanting to fill that gap so you can support whoever's around you. Um, and that's what we focus on, not going to chastise people, going to support and say, let's talk about it, let's increase knowledge, and that will help to increase, you know, people going to mental health services, reaching out to people who are struggling around them, and actually being able to give them some information that helps. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so, Andrea, when we were discussing um, this webinar in advance, you mentioned to me that there was particular stigma among black men and mental health. Would you, would you like to talk about that for a moment and what you wanted to say around that? Yeah, um, I mainly wanted to talk about the black men mental health because mm. I do a lot around for black women. Mm. And I feel like black, for black men, there's like so much daily like inequalities that they face from black men and black boys. So boys um, being excluded from school, um, men and boys being arrested like disproportionately more than anybody else. And so these daily uh, occurrences like over time to these exposures can be very stressful. And then that could then have a knock on effect for their mental health. And so from being an some like a teacher in the educational sector, I feel I'm very passionate about the fact of the labels that we give, especially young black boys um, from that young age. And they, you know, they lived up to that label, unfortunately. And exclusion rates for young black boys are disproportionately higher than any other um, community. And these things that we're not looking into and not understanding how and asking them, how are you? You know, how are you feeling? And I do a lot of, I do 
um, I'm also a youth fitness mentoring um, youth youth fitness mentor, um, and that's the first question I ask is how are you, and sometimes that question can lead to me not even having a physical activity session because asking that one question, and then I feel that a lot of just young people in general, but this is specifically for um, black mental health, a lot of black boys and black men are not asked that question. So they're not used to being able to um, address how they're really feeling without being made to feel like, you know, oh, man up. No, we're all human. So they should be able to address their feelings and state how they're really feeling at any given time, whether they're men or boys. You know, and I feel like for and and in terms of like the um, representation in mental health institutions, there's once again higher rates of of black men who are sectioned, and so it's really it saddens me really, you know, that this is actually happening. And as we said in the beginning, mental health doesn't discriminate. But why are the statistics showing that it, it is for black for the black community and especially black men? who are not, and men in general are not able to, I don't say not able to, because I'm just generalizing, but you know, research states that men find it harder to talk, whereas women may you know, say something to a friend and the friend might catch on, whereas a man, like I say, you know, that whole, we've got to be strong, we've got to man up. Yeah, so I just, I just wanted to just get that point across, basically. No, brilliant. And um, is there any, anyone else that wants to contribute on this? Or? Yeah, and I just want to say um, I agree with everything that Andrew's just been talking about. And it is those structures, and those structures usually start from the home, that the boy is to be strong, like those strong African structures, the man of the house, or, you know, you're grown up, you don't cry now, or you don't do those things. They have to be to, to be very strong. And um, at, at the office, we have um, this project, but we also have a, a children, young people's um project for, for uh, young black kids and one of the um, I suppose anecdotal evidence was um, an, an Asian mother um, had disclosed to my colleague who, who works in that area to say that um, she didn't really realize when her son was telling her he was feeling low because of course you think mental health that's a western term not everyone's going to use that that term the understanding of, of what it is so feeling low or whatever they the, the term people might want to use but when she said his son was was saying this to her, i think his son was about 13 years old she didn't take any notice and, and what she said that she did say to him eventually is stop complaining now if you were a girl I understand if you're a boy, you've got everything to go forward to. He was like a young prince in the house, so the mother ignored it. So it was only because um, through some of the, the things that she was finding out uh, through my colleague about mental health and young people and how it can affect them or how it can um, manifest, that she started to understand that she said she was going to go home and, and speak to her son about it. Because as far as she's concerned, he's a boy, he's a young man, and he's got nothing to worry about. He's not a girl. And that's what she, she was telling her son. And I just think if that's one person saying that to their child, there's lots of people saying the same thing. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Jessica, oh, thank you for joining us. I know you've had a bit of transport trouble. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to just quickly introduce yourself and about your role at Colourful Minds. Sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm late. I did have some um, transport troubles um sod's law um but yeah i'm really excited to be part of this thank you for having me um my name is jess and i am a, a higher trainee in general psychiatry and i'm one of the volunteers at colorful minds um so yeah thanks thanks for having me <laughs> excellent right so um this is a conversation that anyone can contribute to but i'll just start by asking sam about this so there are obviously lots of harmful stereotypes around black people that can negatively impact mental health. So one example is sort of the strong black woman. Um, could we, could, would you like to sort of shine a bit of light on that and talk about that for a moment? Yeah, I think, um, I think Suzanne and Andrea were already touching on it actually about um, some of those stereotypes, the way they work. I mean, it's difficult because I don't want to stamp on anyone's culture, but actually I'm thinking about my own culture as well. I think, Part of it is about 
you know, there's, there's stereotypes within the um, black community and stereotypes kind of external to the, to the black community as well. And if we're talking about the ones within the black community, you know, um, it, in some parts, you know, in, in some places in Africa, actually, if someone has mental health illnesses, they'd probably be kind of ostracized and pushed aside. You know, they wouldn't necessarily be brought in to be supported. You know, you'd, you'd forget about those people. You'd, you'd, you'd send those people away. They wouldn't be the people that you'd be coming into contact on a daily basis. Um, and I think it it's kind of transmits sometimes here, especially when I think about, you know, my parents and their views of mental health when I was growing up and, and what they probably have changed to now and how it's influenced mine. Um, you know, we, we, we kind of look and say, well, that's not for us. You know, we don't normally think about that. You know, we, we, we see people who suffer depression and we think, well, did my parents have depression? Did they, were they a psychotic? Probably not. And, and so we say, oh, it doesn't really exist in, in black culture. So we kind of push it aside and ignore it. And that obviously affects um, how we view people who do struggle with it as well. And then obviously, if you're talking about external to um, black culture, um, the way that black people actually seem to be strong, you know, if we think about pregnancy rates, you know, the amount of um, black women in pregnancy who struggle so much and, and might have poor outcomes because they're felt to be stronger and therefore they should, you know, they, sh um, they shouldn't need uh, pain relief so quickly. And, and all of that is just, you know, promoting this, horrible stereotype that black people are stronger and therefore we don't need as much support or it should take more for us before we get to that point. Um, and actually, I think it actually affects even when we think about in inpatient units, you know, when Suzanne was talking about high rates of detention, but not just even high rates of detention, high rates of um, restraint when they're detained, you know, those people who are held down and, you know, you see four or five people having to hold one person down. Um, not necessarily because they are more violent than anyone else, but because they're black and maybe they're then seen as they're going to be really strong and they're going to be really violent. So we need to be really careful about them. You know, the approaches are very different. And I think that's a real worry when you see those stereotypes, both within the black culture, but then also outside of the black culture and community as well. Thank you. Charles, do you, do you want to contribute on that? Unmute, unmute, space bar. <laughs> we can't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just add to that, yeah, and uh, it was a story that I'm sure a number of you would have heard, but the nature of the views uh, about black men, mad, bad, dangerous, in terms of a view that's often portrayed, um, and going back to what Sam actually just sort of said there, if you've got that view, um, you think to yourself, it's a little wonder the treatment then that is actually given. And the story that always comes to mind, Frank Bruno, that I'm sure all of you will be aware of um, in terms of um, his mental health issues and so forth. Uh, but an episode that took place in his house where um, 11 police cars turned up uh, to deal uh, with what was essentially a domestic issue that he actually had. And that view that people hold about being mad, bad, and dangerous, yeah, uh, was uh, examined in terms of, well, why uh, would you actually sort of believe that in terms of a view? And goes back to the issue in terms of the perceptions that people hold, uh, as Sam was saying, about um, us as black people. Thank you. Can I just add something there to that, Daisy? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So today I actually did a post about um, the strong black woman persona um, and it's something that we that was that Sam mentioned that we can handle anything and we don't you know and if we do look like we're upset we're the angry black woman and so we try to really have this balance of are we okay are we smiling all the time are we and that really and I know that from my own personal point of view can get really straining and I feel like when I was diagnosed in 2015, one, I didn't, I wasn't educated enough about the facts around mental health. And two, I didn't want to say how I was really feeling because I'm that strong black woman. I can handle anything. I'm in charge of two, I'm a head, I was head of two departments in a school. So how am I going to tell my school that I'm feeling low? Am I going to lose my job? All these things are going around in my head. And, and, you know, we've got so much other things that we need to deal with that, societal factors outside of that I feel for me that was what my the, the 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 straw that broke the camel's back it was just everything that was just piling on top of each other 
that actually broke me. Um, and that whole, yeah, I'm a strong, I can do this. But no, I am strong, yes, but equally, I can ask for help and I can say that I am feeling a certain type of way. Um, and I, I've learned to do that now. And I've learned and I've seen that, you know, people from outside of um, the black community can do that very easily. And so I don't see why I can't or we can't. Yeah, so I just wanted to just add that. <laughs> Thank you. Jess, is there anything you wanted to add on this? Um, yeah, I think, I think um, kind of everyone's made great points um, and I think when I think about the strong black man woman um, it kind of makes me think about where that's come from um, and you know obviously we know that it, it, a lot of it comes from having to deal with a lot of trauma um, and it a lot of it also possibly comes from you know I hate to mention it but you know we need, it needs to be mentioned I think a lot of comes comes or has roots um, in slavery so we know that people black people were viewed as less than human they were viewed as you know they're not really human they're they're kind of they're, they're strong and so um we know that they were they had um operations done on them without being anesthetized for example because of you know this this perception that we have some kind of superhuman kind of <laughs> strength and um while it's obviously having strength is is positive um it definitely can have its ne its negative side and i think that is seen in mental health in you know in in seeing that 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 idea that we are we have this kind of superhuman um ability to deal with with the traumas that we we deal with and and we, there are traumas that we deal with that that do make us stronger but um I always kind of it always makes me think like what what are the actual roots of this and um and it's it, it's a it's a positive in, in some regard but it's definitely it definitely does have some negative um con connotations um so you've just touched on trauma um and i just would i'd throw this out to anyone who'd like to answer just to talk a little bit about racism and discrimination as trauma and the impact that it can have on mental health i'm not sure who who would like to answer Oh, Suzanne's unmuted herself. <laughs> She's in there first, everyone. <laughs> I don't even play games, but there's like a game. <laughs> um, yeah, there's something really interesting, and it's so recent. And that was in the British Medical jo uh, Journal in February of this year. And it was written by um, a Professor David Williams. And I'll just read you a little bit what it says. I got loads of stuff on this. But it says, this one he said, People who experience everyday acts of discrimination, like getting poor service in a bank or a restaurant, or being treated with less courtesy, will over time have worse health outcomes, including higher rates of heart disease, lower life expectancy, and greater infant mortality. And that always takes my breath away, because if we think about discrimination, or name calling, or racism, whatever they want to put on it, we've had this since we were kids we do not realize and recognize the massive impact that has on us and i didn't even realize that until i read it and the impact that it have and i think a lot of the um and it's not acknowledged really but the racism that we can face day in day out maybe some of us do or we only had to be kids but we we face it anyway that is like of course the the um the dripping tap syndrome. One spot of water can wear away a mountain, a mountain. So we're, ha we're hearing those negative things all the time and being attacked, verbally attacked, physically attacked, whatever happens. Or you've got children there coming home from school as well and saying the things happen to them. It's, it's huge as a parent as well because you've grown up with it. Now your children are saying it. That's happening to them. It, it's, it's, it's massive, massive. And this has a huge impact on us. And this, I don't, like I say, was only published in 2020 about, about the impact of racism or discrimination on us. So I, I really think that's so important to, to um, acknowledge because I hadn't realized that. But yes, it, it's true. I just wanted to jump in there as well um, <clears throat> because I think it's, it's really important what Suzanne just said as well but also think about what Jess said about the you know that mindset of us 
being seen as strong and how actually when we're constantly experiencing something that's damaging us, damaging us, but people are saying, but you're strong, you're strong. And so we feel that onus to say, okay, no, we are, we are. And so we play up to that strong stereotype and we say, yeah, you know, we're big, we're strong, we can take anything. But on the inside, we're being worn down and worn down and worn down. And like anything, anything in the world, after a while, you're just going to break. You know, and, and it might be a very small thing that happens. You know, it could be something like a bereavement that, you know, other people say, oh, but, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, they've had a good life. But that's the thing that knocks you. Or, you know, you've been rejected from that job and, and it was the one thing that you were hoping on, the one positive that you were holding on to. Um, you know, or suddenly things change, like in this current environment where suddenly you're not able to do all the little things that were prevent, protecting you in terms of your mental health, things that you were doing to try and hold yourself up suddenly because of the lockdown and because of the way things change and the way interactions change, that suddenly breaks you. And you can't hold on to that strong persona anymore and suddenly you break. But then because you're, you've had such traumatic experiences dealing with people of other races or people in general, you might not reach out, you might not take that support, especially if, in all honesty, if we're in a place where we are still the minority and the majority of people who are working in health organizations and, and places of power are going to be people who are not black. There's always going to be that resistance to reach out and take that support. And so that is a, a, a really horrible catch-22 where you have someone who's struggling, but they're being told that they're strong. But inside, they're, they're, they're really broken, but they don't want to reach out to anyone around them because they don't trust those people because of what they've experienced in the past. And it's a horrible cycle that can only lead downwards. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to add something there? Or that's really powerful, Sam. Thank you. Um, so um, the next question, I just, well, I think you've touched on a little bit with lockdown. Um, obviously, coronavirus has disproportionately um, affected the black community. As through your work at Colourful Minds or perhaps at Diverse Cymru, have you have you started to see sort of an impact on the mental health of black communities? Um, I don't know who who wants to. Start there. Charles? Oh, you're on mute still. <laughs> You'll get it right by the end. I think Suzanne Wills, um, we went through this, so um, I think um, uh, she's got some bits that uh, I think are, are relevant, yeah, to looking out at that in terms of a group she was on. So, uh, Suzanne, um, unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Just did. Okay. But, um, okay, I was part of... Um, for a couple of months anyway from from about april to to june there was um the first minister in wales welsh government first ministers um bain covid 19 social economic group i mean it's a long 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 uh, list there's no long long title but i was part of that and the report had just was just published now on the 22nd of june um and, it's, and, and in the report, it states, the report finds that race inequalities exist in Wales. In light of COVID-19, the lack of poor quality of ethnicity data and racial inequalities has resulted in poor health decisions. And Bain communities face higher risk of catching and dying from the disease. Then, um, then the, the report has like loads of sections in it to do with racism to do with inequalities um to do with um education just loads and and there's quite a few um recommendations that have come out of it and one of them even though we were started in march but it's, it's been held up now um the wales are writing um a race equality strategy from wales so even though i know we used to have um the commission for racial equality and everything then the we had the equality act out and then I know a lot of us were saying, well, once the Equality Act come out, and of course, we got intersectionality. You can be black, older, gay, disabled. You can be all those things. But if you're black first, um, you know, we, we face a lot of things. And then if you've got all the other things as well, well, you know, you can, you can forget the services, really. But they're writing now, they're writing a, a race equality strategy because, again, they can see what's been what's happening with black people and then the george floyd, george floyd murder isn't it the covid19 something has to happen you know a change is going to come and i think the change is coming because i do think that now we're being listened to and it, it might speed things up a little bit i might not see it in my lifetime 
but I think changes are happening and, and positively as well. Um, one of the things, so there's the race equality strategy that's coming out of it. Um, and it says the plan must acknowledge how COVID-19 has exposed existing health inequalities and in some cases exacerbated them. The, um, Wales governments are also, also trying to encourage the political engagement of BAME communities. So trying to make us some leaders or allow us to be leaders because we are capable. We do, you know, we do have the skills to, to be leaders. But another one under the uh, cultural suitability of healthcare services, because we're, we're on about healthcare, we're on about mental health. It says commit to support and fund practical ongoing actions in providing appropriate, equitable, and culturally competent mental health services to individuals from BAME backgrounds to help address the acknowledged inequities that exist in mental health take up and service provision. And it says this to be achieved through, the, through utilising the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Wales, uh, the endorsed BAME Mental Health Cultural Competence Certification Scheme and any other practical action. And that's an immediate, that's an immediate action um, in, in the report that came out in, in, in June. And, and I don't know if it's going to talk about it now, but Charles will come on to that certification scheme and the work that we're doing in Wales. So I'm glad there's something that happening in Wales, especially with the, the Black Lives Matter. There's been a lot of um, meetings and discussion around the things that we're going, th going through, but also the things that we can do as a solution. Because I always say that, I say, since we've had the certification scheme and we're, we're going into our third year now, I said, instead of having now every year, we could have said, and guess what else? And guess what else they're doing to us? Guess what else has happened to us? But we've come up with what well, we're hoping for Wales anyway as a solution. And even though I'm saying this for Wales, we are working in Southern Ireland um, on their mental health reform with this certification scheme um, as well. But we can come on to that later. But yeah, that's what I want to say about what's happening in Wales and the COVID-19. Thank you, Suzanne. And yeah, we will we'll come on to it a little bit later about the certification. So, um, Andrea, would, um, coronavirus has obviously shone a light on how intertwined mental health and physical health are. Um, and I know that you wanted to talk specifically about how, how that can... Um, yeah, would, would you like to share a little bit about the, the connection between mental and physical health and your experiences? Okay, so, from my own personal experience, as I mentioned before, I was diagnosed in 2015 with a mental health illness and depression and anxiety. And the doctor prescribed me antidepressants. Um, and as someone like I keep mentioning, I wasn't educated. I didn't know that there was other options there for me, you know, like talking therapies or anything like that, because it wasn't stated to me and I didn't know about anything else. I, I did go down the antidepressant route, but he also mentioned about going to the gym. Now, when it was mentioned to me, or taking up some form of physical activity, when it was mentioned to me, I couldn't pin the two together and understand why he was telling me that. You know, I felt he was make, thinking that I was, you know, there was something else wrong with me, why I needed to go to the gym. He wasn't really making it clear as to why he was making that suggestion. But I thought if it meant that I would, you know, get back on the road to recovery and be a mother to my son, because that went downhill because I wasn't able to manage myself properly. I thought, okay, I'm gonna do that. So to cut a long story short, I signed up at a gym and it so happened to be a bodybuilding gym. And when I say bodybuilding gym, a gym where there's loads of people there that were going doing bodybuilding competitions and they were there every day. They were in their own zone. They were eating healthily and I was having conversations with them. And I thought, you know what, this is something that could potentially be useful for me. Um, and so I set myself a goal. Now, if I didn't see these people, I don't think that I probably would have stayed in the gym, but because I, I saw them and I started to set myself a goal, that's how I was able to see the correlation between mental health and physical health and the benefits. And um, when the doctor, I always laugh at this part, when the doctor mentioned about in raising, like increasing my endorphins, I like, are you giving me more medication? Because I didn't know what endorphins, I shouldn't really say this because it makes it sound really silly, but I didn't know, understand about endorphins. And obviously my, over time going to the gym and working out and I was beginning to feel what endorphins actually does to a person. And it was, it was really good for my, you know, my overall general health. 
And so now that's what where the youth fitness mentoring program was born out of because I was able to see firsthand the benefits of physical activity. And it doesn't mean the gym for everybody. And I always state that, you know, whatever. You, and that's why my organization is called Focus on Creating Your Ultimate Self. So what's, what's your ultimate self, whether it be the gym, whether it be swimming, walking, basketball, whatever it is for you, do what works for you, but do some, try and do something um because there are like really great benefits from it and i think especially in the black community you know the gym is not for everyone so maybe getting walking or getting off of the a stop um a stop before your normal stop just trying to incorporate some form of physical activity in your daily um lifestyle and you know especially what we eat as well you know, the salt content i could go on a lot about the nutritional side of things but we're talking about physical activity but i think it all interconnects with each other you know you can't you really can't have one without the other and as i always say your um your physical health is just as important as your mental health and they both for me now i realize how they both go together and why it was suggested to me to use physical activity as a means to manage my health in general Thank you. Jess, is there anything that you'd like to add about the connection of mental and physical health? Okay, my face bar stopped working. That's, that's <laughs> great. Um, yeah, so I mean, definitely agree. Um, I think um, Andrea sort of covered everything perfectly. Um, I think one of the main ways that people can realise that there is a link between your physical health and your mental health is you know, if you're feeling anxious or nervous so you know you have a feeling of you know I've, I've got this deadline tomorrow or I've got this date tomorrow and you've got you know butterflies in your stomach your heart is racing you know your mouth feels dry um and I think that's because so, sometimes it can be it can be difficult to understand how the, the 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 kind of mental and the mind can manifest in the body but I think that's quite a, 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 a simpler way because people I mean I, I'm sure everyone's felt you know those sensations and known that there isn't that aren't actually like butterflies <laughs> um, but yeah and and it can also it, it's also good to note that when you're seeing different people because um, some people's mental illness can manifest kind of physically so they'll come and they'll you know they'll have all these complaints um, I've got these headaches, I've got this stomach pain, and there's nothing going on. Um, and certain cultures that is quite common in certain in kind of certain cultures in certain communities. Um, and so, you know, that has to be um, you have to bear that in mind when you're when you're seeing certain people as well. Um, so yeah, I basically, just want to agree um, that there is definitely um, a link, and you know, um, it, it 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 also helps when you're um, offering management and treatment as, as what Andrea experienced. Can I just add one more thing to what I was saying as well? Um, social prescribing. So I I'm, I'm, would have started to be part of a social prescribing um, activity in a local bar near me. And, but because of COVID that didn't happen, but I feel like that should be more, um, the social prescribing, what I was doing mainly towards young people. But I just think in general, social prescribing to do different activities and not just medication and for me physical activity is one of the social prescribing um things that i i actually offer so i just, just want to add that in <laughs> thank you right so um this is first suzanne and charles so obviously at Di diverse can read the sort of tagline is equality for all so could you just talk a little bit about what you're doing at diverse can read to promote equality do you want to start, Suzanne, and then we'll ask Charles about, about the project? No, I'll, I'll do this. Oh, Charles, this Charles, you're on it? Yes. Yeah, it's okay. I think, uh, in a way, in terms of um, the strapline diversity or equality for all, uh, was something that we developed when the organisation was first set up in 2011. In the context of this, I just want to uh, share by using the terminology or definitions of diversity and equality uh, to explain uh, in terms of um, what I feel this means, particularly with regard to mental health. Diversity uh, in itself uh, is difference, and using that as a, a basis of uh, an equality, uh, that of equality of 
opportunity, but also uh, being treated fairly and appropriately. So looking at the distinction from between those two things, uh, then in terms of taking the view around mental health together, what I very strongly believe that um, as has been, I think, clearly identified that there isn't equality for all uh, within uh, the, co the context of what we're actually looking at. And a key part for this, and I've been really pleased to see some of the comments that's coming up, is this issue, um, very simply put, uh, around difference and how people treat people who are different, particularly if you're culturally different. And as such, to me, this issue around equality for all, until you're able to kind of deal with those issues, um, you're not going to get too far forward. And that's what I'll be speaking about in a moment, because the nature of that is you think about it. If you see somebody, and sometimes you're not even aware, because uh, I saw the, some bits around unconscious bias and so forth, uh, of how you react to people who are different. And that is a major factor in terms of services or the poor services uh, that particular groups actually receive. So this issue that we have in terms of equality for all, there's work to be done in terms of ever achieving that. And part of that work is about what actions we can actually take to actually do that. Which segues, segues very nicely into you talking about your work. So tell, tell us all, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll stay on in terms of that. Okay. In short, uh, as I said, I've been looking at uh, a lot of the comments and so forth and pleased about the issues about uh, addressing education, uh, about comments on being able to deal with the issue around culture, uh, the issues around unconscious bias and so forth, which leads very nicely into a basis of uh, what Suzanne had intimated with regard to uh, the work uh, that we're uh, currently engaged with in seeking from a basis of rather than policy but practice what changes can be made particularly in terms of the services provided uh, by both organizations and practitioners yeah uh, in terms of dealing with the disparities and in inequality that exists um, what I'm very keen uh, to say to you is that um, what I'm going to outline, I wouldn't say to you for one moment is a pa panacea and a cure-all or even what Suzanne said, a solution. It's a means uh, to actually start addressing uh, the issues that we've had in terms of a lack of progress over the many years in terms of that. And I say that in terms of um, my own position uh, within Welsh Government where I had the responsibility in terms of defining and designing in terms of equality strategies and so forth, often leading to, yeah, good policies, but uh, in terms of whether that meant in terms of any uh, real movement forward, um, I'd say to you uh, plainly, that often doesn't happen. So a view that we had was, well, uh, we would need to actually seek to do something uh, in terms of uh, Suzanne used the term making people accountable and uh, what we came up with um, in 2016 Suzanne wrote a cultural competency toolkit as a start good guidance good information but rather than leaving that sit on a shelf somewhere uh, we decided we needed to do something uh, to actually uh, deal with the issues in a positive practical way and what came about in terms of that uh, was a basis of designing a certification scheme. And the title in it, I think, is important. A Workplace Good Practice Certification Scheme. And the basis of workplaces, not whole organisations, but being able to break this down to share good practice uh, is a key factor 
uh, that has been seen such success yeah, over the two years that we've been uh, running uh, with this particular scheme. The scheme itself, in very simple terms, and I'll be happy to um, share information with you all, or answer questions around that, is unique in the sense that uh, developed with our, a partner, which is the United Kingdom Investors in Equality and Diversity, an accreditation agency, um, we looked at uh, what are the main factors in your workplace, particularly for those providing services for black mental health patients, or in fact, not providing the services uh, that they should be doing, issues around accessibility and so forth, that we could actually uh, look at developing something to address those issues. Um, so uh, having gone through a process of talking to both service users, uh, to practitioners, and indeed organizations uh, about uh, who uh, were providing services for uh, BAME people, uh, we came up with what I think is a very practical tool uh, which uh, addresses uh, five assessment areas, nothing that you wouldn't uh, think, uh, the sort of things that you would need to address from a workplace perspective. How welcoming is your environment? How well do you communicate or consult with your community? Um, how good is your understanding around culture and equality more generally? What's your management commitment to cultural competence? What is the, um, how do you engage? And importantly as well, how do you monitor that you're actually providing a service yeah, uh, for everybody that's equitable and actually is appropriate yeah, for the needs of the different people in your communities? And I think one of the things found very early on from doing that was a view from many uh, that we don't have a problem. Uh, there's no problem here, or uh, we don't have any black people <laughs> uh, in that, so we don't have to do anything. Um, none of which is acceptable or accepted because, again, even in Wales, by example, um, when you look at the staff uh, in a certain of the health boards that we were working with, yeah, a large number of that staff are from the BAME community, uh, yet a very, very small percentage of the service users who they have are very small yeah, in terms of, of numbers. Anyway, looking at uh, the issues uh, uh, to, to deal with this, the scheme itself has two main parts to it. And this is why I'm pleased in terms of what's been said. A one part, and uh, there's a lot of debate around the issues around unconscious bias and cultural competence and so forth. Uh, but uh, we've developed uh, a very interactive, and Sam said something before in terms of being able to sit down and talk to people uh, about issues around um, things like culture and so forth. Yeah. So a part of it is the mandatory requirement uh, to um, undertake. Um, it's not training because it is about a discussion to get people to start thinking uh, about their attitudes and their points. And the issue around unconscious bias, a key factor, and again, some of you in, uh, will be aware of the extent to which the unconscious mind controls so much of what we actually do, including whether we know it or not. And I'm not saying to you there isn't both conscious and unconscious bias, but the fact of the matter is, in terms of even without knowing it, uh, we treat people differently, coming back to what I said previously as far as culture. And that in itself often leads to disparities and the difference in services we actually provide. So that part of it sits alongside. And this has been always the problem. People would say we need training. <laughs> so you give them a bit of training and they'll tick the box. Uh, but 
what was clear to us and what the scheme actually does is to say, right, okay, that's one part. Now, what you've got to do is show us and evidence what practices you're putting in place in terms of your day-to-day -day practice to deal with this issue. And that in a way that in terms of providing guidance, support, and ongoing help has gone down really well to the point that in terms of all the participants uh, that we're working with, and this is quite unusual, all seven health boards in Wales are taking part in the scheme. And uh, in terms of the makeup of Wales, it's very rare <laughs> that you'd ever get um, all the health boards yeah, buying into something. Uh, uh, the two key factors, to my mind, in terms of the de development was one, that it had to be cost effective and also resource effective. And in terms of the way in which the scheme has been developed, it does both of those things. So people can't say I can't afford it because it, uh, it is, and I won't bore you the details, so cost effective. People uh, uh, laugh when I say in terms of the cost of the certification, but that's one part of it. Yeah. And the, the nature in terms of resources, um, there is a website uh, and also a very simple, I say simple across the assessment areas, a workbook that they've got to complete and evidence practically, not policies, what they're actually doing uh, to move things forward uh, for the community, particularly the black community that they have in each of their areas. So that part of it, and again, using the term culture, uh, but it is focused on BAME people in terms of the basis, because that's the first thing you often see, and that's the least represented, yeah, as far as uh, uh, the issues and the greatest disparities. And some of the figures that Suzanne set out earlier, that's just some of them in terms of how bad these things will be, yeah. So, in a sense, uh, what I would say to you uh, to kind of finish yeah, uh, is that the success of the scheme, uh, which seeks to proactively address uh, any cultural or unconscious bias issues and provide um, participants with relevant tools, resources, and ongoing support. Those two things in themselves may seem like nothing, but it's been well received. And for people who are often lack confidence and are even scared in terms of being able to address the issue, what we found is a significant turnaround, yeah, in terms of a basis of people uh, properly addressing uh, the issues of culture and unconscious bias. And as a consequence, the better outcomes uh, for black people, um, certainly uh, around the participants we'll be working with. Thank you, Charles. Um, someone's asked in the questions if you could put the website name in the, we'll just tell people so that they can access it themselves. Okay. Um, if you go to the Diverse Cymru website, um, there is a, um, I think on the very front page, uh, it talks about the cultural competency scheme. Yeah and uh, uh, the information booklet you'll be able to get from there uh, is um, uh, set out what the scheme is about. Thank you. Right, so um, to leave room for questions, we've got one question for Andrea on resilience, but first, as the mental health research charity, we couldn't run an entire webinar without, um, without talking even more about research. I know Suzanne mentioned hers before. Um, we have a platform called Participate where people, where researchers can put their studies on um, for mental health and people can sign up. So it connects the researchers with the people who want to take part in mental health research. Um, and the overwhelming majority of people who take part in mental health research are white women. And this I'm sure circles back to the conversations about stigma that we were all having earlier. Um, but I would love just very brief answers from any of you about suggestions about what the research community can do to make studies more um, diverse and inclusive. Well, can I 
Look at me jump, jumping in again, see? But I was, <laughs> I was reading some stuff today. Again, it was from the British Medical Journal. And the heading was, um, ex exclusion from population studies is a form of institutional racism. And they're talking about older people from ethnic minorities. It says are one of the most disadvantaged and excluded groups in societies. And it says the UK has not collected any survey data specifically on older ethnic minority populations since about 2004, it said the last year when the health survey for England oversampled ethnic minority people um, over 15 years. And they found the proportion of people of age 61 to 17, 70, 61 to 70, hadn't been um, researched or there's nothing about them. You see, because in my work for Welsh Government, I, I work on mental health, but in other parts of my work, I've got to look around at uh, black people and dementia. Now I even know, and I've been reaching out all the time to find out where can I get some funding so we can get a researcher around black people with dementia and their carers, how they co how they're coping during this pandemic and what would make things better for them. So this is a question I've been asking for months and trying to get some funding and I still haven't got any funding for anything. So older people is an area I think where you, you need to be looking as well because I think that that portion of people and including myself seems to be like wiped off. We can do the work or we used to talk to before those things but we, you know, we're part of the population and we have needs and we have issues and we need to get our voice heard out there. So I think look at some... Um, uh, sorry, being black, I always say all the time, but I, you know what I mean. So I'll say being um, older populations then and find out what it is for them. And especially like I'm saying, the dementia, there is no stats around black people, dementia and, and their carers and how they're coping in this COVID-19. There's nothing out there. Um, thank you. And then Jess, have you got any suggestions about how mental health research could be more inclusive? um yeah i think i think i think it's it's good that there is there is now some awareness that you know that the um, black people are underrepresented in this research um so that's a very good first step because i think if we don't realize that there's a problem then there's no way we're going to try and fix it um i think i mean i miss i miss the stigma the stigma part but i think a lot of stigma you know stigma has has a lot to do with it and if people are not willing to talk about you know mental illness then it might be difficult to get them to you know find out the, about experiences because they're just like what are you talking about there's nothing nothing's going on um and so i think addressing stigma is you know is really important and and if you're if, if you're addressing stigma you're likely to be doing it in, in those places that are experiencing stigma a lot, including the black community. And therefore that can be a way to, um, that can be, that can be a way to um, kind of reach that community because you're, you start off doing the work rather than kind of going in and trying to find things out. You start off doing the work against stigma, against, you know, trying to educate people. Um, and I think that would be a good way to, then tap into those people because you know first of all finding out what, what it is that is causing people to um struggle to participate um and then um once you found them then i guess you can you know ask them wherever you want <laughs> thank you um so before we do questions i just wanted to finish with something positive i know andrea your speciality is resilience so i would love you to talk about that for a little bit before we open up for questions nearly <laughs> um so yeah so resilience it means a lot to me because i had to learn to build my resilience from when i was you know had my deep depression and really got deep into the a dark place um, and for me resilience is aka the bounce back but I want to call it now the bounce forward because I don't feel like I'm bouncing back I feel like we need to bounce forward and especially with black women and that's who I'm working primarily with I work with all women but I'm creating a space now for black women to 
to learn how to bounce forward, to learn how to be resilient from some of the things that we've mentioned in, in this webinar and um, that we've been facing over many years. You know, for me, the stigma of um, being diagnosed and, you know, bouncing forward from that and building the resilience from that, building my growth mindset and just really helping women to, or just in general, but to strengthen and align their mind, body and soul um, so that they can thrive and rise. And it's all about, you know, thriving and rising to above like all different challenges. So I wouldn't say, cause I went through mental health doesn't mean that resilience means that you have to go through a mental health issue. It's just whatever the challenge is for you and for helping them to feel like optimistic about their future. Um, that we don't, we're not stuck in that age of, oh, well, this has happened, so I'm just gonna stay here. Um, I can't do anything about it. Changing that whole uh, mindset and just becoming more confident in who we are and what we're capable of. Because I know for myself, when I was starting my business, um, I had that negative mindset of the fact, you know, how am I a black woman from London? No, no, no um, real example or experience of starting a business. How am I going to start a business? And it was being able to bounce forward from that and just having building that resilience against the fact that I can do it. If I put my mind to doing something, I can that be, do and have all that I desire and deserve. And so for me, resilience is just showing others that it is possible to bounce forward from different, diff different life challenges, whatever that means to that particular person. Um, I did like problem solving. So there's, for me, the work that I do with resilience, there's a lot of different factors that I include or different topics that I include within my work. But just on a whole, it's just I educating people to know that they can overcome many challenges by bouncing forward and mainly by like the growth mindset and the physical activity educating yourself talking to others and knowing that you and the main thing knowing that you're not alone in this and i feel that that's really important for you know the bain community we because we hide i say hide but we don't talk a lot about our feelings especially when it's to do with our mental health you know you feel that you're alone i know i felt like i was alone like, no, I, I haven't heard any of my friends or family members talk about having been diagnosed with a mental health illness openly. So when I was talking about it, I was even asked not to mention the words mental health. I was like, how am I going to talk about my story and not mention the words mental health? Someone else in the, in, uh, from the black community, from Elder, said to me, you know, why are you chatting your business? And it's not about that. So it's just bouncing forward from all of these different adversities in life and showing people that it, it is possible to, to bounce forward and to build. Resilience is, is, is a skill, it's, you know, that we can all learn. So I think that that's another thing that's important to let people know. You're not, you know, you're not just born with resilience, you learn it and you, you can learn it at any age. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna move on to some questions. We've got a few lined up. Thank you for everyone who submitted. We will try and whiz through them efficiently because we've got 15 minutes left. Um, so, um, the first question, I think maybe we'll direct this at Sam, if that's okay, um, is what would you advise for BAME men and women who may wish to seek mental health diagnosis, treatment or support, but are worried about being mistreated? Um, I would say it's really important that if you are struggling that you get some kind of support. Um, I think first and foremost, it's about using the support you have around you. Um, obviously, you know, Andrea was talking about around you, family, friends, um, but I think it's about using them. Um, I think sometimes there's that fear about engaging with, um, you know, services because if you think, you know, what they're going to think of you, how are they going to treat you, or you just don't know what to expect. But if you've got a friend or a family member that's around you, then I think speaking to them about what you're struggling with um, can help because it lightens that load a little bit. Um, it gives you someone that can you can bounce some ideas off, and it then gives you someone that hopefully can support you to then engage in services. Um, you know, appointments. When we do appointments, I'm sure Jess will confirm. You know, we don't tell people to wait outside. You know, if you've come with someone who's going to support you, then that's okay. Whether it be a mother, father, brother, sister, next door neighbour, it's not a problem. You know, um, so. If you feel that you need someone to support you to get to that stage, then then please use it. But but I would say that in wherever you are in your local community, there's there's going to be a service that is there to try and help you. Um, 
And whilst it might be scary, it's not about throwing a label on you or throwing medication at you automatically. It's about you engaging in something that is going to help you. Because if you're in a dire situation, then the same way if you had a broken leg, you wouldn't sit at home and say it will fix itself. You know, you might say, I need to go to the hospital. I need some help with this. And I will treat mental health the same way. Um, but it's because we don't know much about it, or at least when, you know, when in a position, we might not know much about it. But let's go to someone who does know a bit more about it and get that help and support. Thank you. Right then. Um... Sorry, I'm having problems with my mute button. I think this is a recurring theme of the webinar. <laughs> um, right then, uh, just bear with me a sec. So um, perhaps this is a bit of a, a chicken and egg question, but we'll throw it out and see who, who'd like to answer. So obviously we've established that race is a major challenge for mental health, um, um, but how does it get addressed? Is it by addressing race as a society or is there a me mental health specific response? Who wants to have a go? <laughs> Go on, Suzanne. <laughs> oh, you need to unmute yourself. You hold the space bar. Okay. I'd love to say the question again now. What did you say? So, what, what's the question? So the question was that obviously that racism has a major challenge to mental health for black people. Um, and how does it get addressed? Is it by addressing racism on a society level or is it mental health specific response? Well, you say is it a mental health or society on, on the whole? Well, society society is, is made up of people and people work in mental health. So I think all of us need to be educated and we need to um, break down the negative stereotypes and not think that all black men are stronger than, you know, Mr. Muscle, because, because they're not. Like we're, we're, we're black women, but we are women first. Don't have to put the, all the, the stereotypes on us. We are people first. I wonder what they would say to a white woman with a darker sun tan than I am on my color. What would they say to her? Oh, you don't need much medication because she looks like a strong black woman. No, they wouldn't say they can see it's a white woman with a tan and it's, 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 it's a color. So we all need to be educated and especially in services because we get our treatment through the services, not through the policies. The policies can influence, the, 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 um, the service can influence the policies, not the other way around. We need to know that when we, uh, we're going for uh, treatment, just as, um, as Sam has said, we're going for treatment, the people that we're going to see, see treatment for, we shouldn't be frightened of them and they shouldn't be frightened of us. Like the, I don't know if you know the report, Breaking the Circles of Fear, where they say, we're frightened to approach the services, but the service provider is frightened of us. Like we're going to, we're stronger, lock them up, throw away the key, all those things, the negative stereotype that has to be broken down. Now that report was written in 2002 by the Sainsbury Centre, and we're still, still saying the same things now. So maybe we should look at some old reports and just see what did they say because i think we're saying the same things today but the white system or the systemic racism as, as we call it that has to be broken down and there needs to be more of us more of black people as leaders as leading a team and understanding about other people understand like charles says about other cultures because it's not always down to color it's about other cultures and treating people appropriately and finding out about them because one of the things that's said about data for example oh we haven't got much data we don't like to ask or it's a sensitive subject well what's more sensitive because we do ask the questions on asking somebody about sexually transmitted diseases or asking a loved one when their loved one have died can we take their organs those are sensitive subjects to ask me about my cultural background it's not sensitive at all because if I think you've got an interest in me I want to tell you so it's about those things I think just I, and I don't know why they make out that sensitivity but knocking knocking the edge off it really and just being people with some humanity and treating other people with humanity I don't know I, I, I go on thank and you. on really, but it, it makes me mad you see and then <laughs> thank you and Suzanne. okay um so 
Uh, just a question for anyone who wants to answer. Are mental health services starting to acknowledge the role of racism on BAME mental health or is it falling on deaf ears? Who wants to nip in there? Jess? <laughs> I said, I think the, the these buttons are on strike today. Um, yeah, I think I think um, that 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 is. I think mental health services, particularly in London, because like you know, London probably has the has the largest population of black um, of BAME or black people, um, are starting to acknowledge the effects of of racism, particularly in the current climate with what's going on. What's going on. Um, and I think, I mean, I mean, I'm probably biased because I'm a psychiatrist and I'm in mental health, but I think that mental health in terms of healthcare are actually quite good, uh, or, the, or the trusts that I've worked in are quite good at, you know, picking up on these things and trying to do th something about it, especially more recently. Obviously, we know that mental health services have, have a bit of a difficult history that no one wants to talk about. Um, but I think more recently, things that people are realizing have an effect on people's mental health um, people are doing things about it so people are having talks you know there are talks like this in in trusts that i've work, worked in there, are, there have been um series series of talks um, about things like this and people are now asking questions what can we do you know what are the issues what you know you know how can we address it so i think in my experience that i've, I've found that um people are finally starting to realise that this is a problem and, and things have been done. Obviously, there's a long way to go, but we've also come a long way, I think. Thank you. Um, so this is an anonymous question. Um, how do we create change in a majority white mental health organisation when the leadership is all white and may find it challenging to learn from BAME colleagues and take real action? How about Charles, would you be able to? Yeah, I was just going to say something with regard to what um, Jessica was saying first, and I'll, I'll answer this one as well. Um, one of the things that I think is a good opportunity now uh, to get people to listen, uh, given what's taken place. But here's the worry. Uh, it won't last, uh, because um, in a year's time, um, my worry would be is that a lot of this would be forgotten and uh, you tend to sort of go back, yeah, because then, as has been mentioned, this is nothing new, it's been going on for a long time, reports have been there, research has been done. Uh, so it's about what opportunities we take uh, whilst we have what at least is a partly open door uh, to actually move things forward. So that was the, the last one. In terms of, okay. um, this one in terms of uh, uh, the colleagues, in terms of, um, Actually, it's, um, the issue around education awareness uh, has been brought up over and over again. And I don't know in terms of being able to say uh, that this opportunity that I'm saying to you that now exists to make people actually see that they shouldn't feel threatened. And in many ways, what also in terms of um, uh, the white managers in the main is that they and people talked about person-centered approaches to delivering services yeah is that they should be doing yeah their jobs properly in terms of being able uh, not to be to fear uh, someone who's different to them uh, but to encourage and promote and it's easy to say uh, but I said to you that in terms of people and the way in which they feel and think often difficult in terms of being able to lose sight of and I go back to the issue of unconscious bias that you actually have yeah which actually plays a big part in not wanting to change and can I just say something as well so no. because um, I said I'm at um, a meeting yesterday and um, that the 500 people was part of it and it was the national mapping of BAME mental health services this is the report from BAME stream and you're all aware about BAME stream and they say it's it's um it's a collection BAME stream is a new alliance of practitioners therapists policy specialists 
organizations, activists, and academia who specialize in the area of mental health and well-being. And they've called it mainstream because they say it's about mainstream, but having black influences to influence the mainstream services um, around black mental health. And the report was just published in July uh, 2020, and it was, it was uh, come out yesterday. So I would urge all of you, or any of you, if you heard of it, to download this. And it's on the Ubelli website, and also if you go to Bainstream, it's on their website as well. And this came out yesterday. I just wanted to support something quickly what Charles said um, in regards to you know that door being open um, you know with regards to it being a current issue and we're talking about it now I think now is the opportunity for people who care to get into those positions because I, I'll, be, I'll be quite frank and this you know it might be a bit much but I think the people who are in those positions right now they don't care they didn't care and these current situations are pushing them because they concerned about what their stakeholders think about them and how that affects how they're able to function whether it be financially whether it be about public image but actually the people who really care about these situations are you know the people now the people who are in these kind of webinars people who are talking and asking the questions and i think it's about us stepping forward and saying okay now's the opportunity to take more active roles and i'm not just talking about black people i'm talking about people who of any ethnicity who care need to be stepping forward and saying i want to be part of that high management role that position of power but i want to go in there with a mindset that is different to what is there now not that they're going to go in there and start chucking out every single person who's white that, that's not what we're talking about we're talking about making changes to improve equality to reduce that inequality with, between people in those situations and every circumstance that they're able to influence whether that be financial whether that be in in healthcare, whether that be in any kind of employment situation it's about people stepping in and saying i care so let me take that role and I'm going to do something different to what's been done before. Thank you, Sam. That's a brilliant, brilliant note to finish on. Um, I just want to say, I'm sorry we didn't get through all of your questions, but I just think this is such a huge topic that the fact that we've managed to fit so much in in an hour and a half is pretty impressive. But, would, you know, to do this to do this subject justice, we probably need a series. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much to all of our guests. You've all been fantastic. Um, really enjoyed hearing what you've got to say. Um, and just for a little bit of a plug for everyone's social media handles, you can follow Colourful Minds on Twitter at Minds Colourful, Diverse Cymru on Diverse Cymru, um, and then Andrea on Miss underscore Corbett. Um, but you can, I mean, we've been tagging everyone on our socials, so have a look at MQ's social media if you would like to see that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, all of our guests. Thank you for everyone who came. There's so many of you here that, here that have showed up and are interested in this really important subject. Um, so yes, have a lovely evening. Um, and we'll see if we can address some of these questions that didn't get answered um, um, in some blogs and some follow-up. So yes, thank you everyone and have a lovely evening.